Lorenzo, we're back. Uh, our final episode of this series, and I mean this series, this yes. game thing. Anyway, the, the, uh, the, the launch, launching game. series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've done uh, shorts. We've got 12 plus a bonus episode of at least 45. Most of them are like 40 to 45 minutes at least long. Uh, we've covered raping. We've covered Augusta Springs. We've covered African American history. We've covered Grandma Moses. We keep on going, Nancy. What else? We, we, oh, we've got we've done floods of the area, particularly Stanton. Uh, we've done the pandemic. Um, Buena we, Vista. We did Buena Vista. We did um, the the story of how Augusta County got started. Um, what are some of the other things we've done, Richard? I don't know, but it's literally just a massive amounts of information. Yeah, the the myth the myths of history that was that was a fun one. You know, okay, were yeah. people really shorter back then. Um, did they burn their skirts? Yeah, did women burn up uh, by fire? You know, um, did does glass flow? Things like that. So, anyway, uh, and today we're going to close out our uh, uh, episode twelve, and this is part two of African American history. In, in, in Augusta County. And once again, I'm Richard Adams. This is Nancy Sorrells. And uh, our thanks to uh, our very, um, our, our, our sponsor, Catherine Morris. And you think you gotta be rich to be a sponsor, but that is not true. You think you gotta be some corporation. Catherine is a retired school librarian. She just loves history. Right, and, and we are the best deal around. We're um, the best you can, deal you can sponsor us if you love our stories, if you love, it's got ideas for stories. Hey, just for 25 bucks, 50 bucks, uh, what's, what's the max 150? You can, you can get your name up in lights on our, and our series footnotes and Valley history. So anyway, so let's, let's go right into, uh, African American history part two, start it up. All right. Well, we, we left off at, at the civil war. Um, and this is a, let's just say this is a, a very, uh, time, uh, a newsworthy subject right now um, because we're right in the middle of I think our country pushing forward again to try to, to achieve some racial racial uh, justice um, it's it's been a 400 year struggle and um, we're, we've made lots of progress we've got a long way to go um, but understanding the story and where we've come from and where we're going uh, is I think key to to us being successful in moving that arc forward in as far as justice and and um, having the American dream for for all of our, our citizens. So we left off of the Civil War um, and in, in Augusta County, and that's really what we're focusing on is Augusta County in the upper valley, the southern part of the Shenandoah Valley. Um, at the eve of the Civil War in Augusta County, 20% of the population uh, was African American and the majority of those were enslaved people. So um, it was a, a very uh, in, in, ingrained um, part of our society. And, um, and we've been working since the end of the Civil War to try to, to repair uh, the damage that we, we did for the, the first um, couple hundred years in this country. And we're, we're working on it. So, let, so the Civil War ends, um, the South loses, that's a good thing as far as uh, American history, as far as um, keeping our country together and understanding and finally solving our constitutional crisis of whether a state can leave and be independent or whether we are one nation um, that, that you can't dissolve at, at, some, at one state's whim. And so we, we decided that um, it really took from you know, the 1780s when the constitution was created till the end of the civil war and we're still, that's why we have a Supreme Court. We're still resolving and, 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 and polishing uh, that, that constitution. Um, but the other, the, probably the most important thing that came out of the war was the end of slavery um, in, the, in this nation uh, all, forever. And so there were a series of amendments that, uh, that have, and uh, amendments that came out of that civil war, um, constitutional amendments. And um, the, the, first, the first one was, of course, the 13th Amendment um, that abolished slavery. And uh, it officially abolished it um, and continues to prohibit slavery. Slavery can never come back in this country. Okay. Um, and that, um, that happened. Uh, it was passed. I've got it here. It was passed in the Senate on April 8th, 1864, and the House on January 31st, 1865. It was imperative that Lincoln get that get that done before the war ended because there was 
there was a lot of talk about maybe just settling with the Confederacy, and then you would have then you would have two separate countries or coming up with some peace settlements that would bring slavery back into the Union. So it needed to be and, done. And before. That was done with a basically, I, I say it, but a Northern House and Senate. Well, actually, that's right because yeah. there, were, there was done, nobody. If they'd have been back together and done it, it probably wouldn't have passed. Right. Or well, and and but it, it would have depended on what kind of terms the, the South would have come back into the Union or separated. You're right, exactly. So it was ratified on December 6, 1865, after the war ended. Um, and so, and then there was, that was followed up, that was the 13th Amendment, that was followed up with the 14th Amendment that declared that all persons born or naturalized in this country are American citizens, including African Americans who were born um, as enslaved people, but were now free and they got full citizenship. And that was ratified in 1868. Um, and that was followed up um, by the 15th Amendment that prohibit, prohibits the govern, governance from uh, the government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, which means previously that were slaves. And that was ratified in 1870. It doesn't mean that everything was all equal then. And in fact, um, the South, after, it, after Reconstruction in the South came back in as a full, uh, a full, you know, uh, part of this nation, um, then began to to enact laws that that restricted uh, those those newly freed people from having full citizenship, and that was called the Jim Crow South. And so there was a period that was uh, very rosy uh, for about 15, 20 years, and then and then it became tighter and tighter again. Not moving back into slavery, but moving into second class citizenship uh, for African Americans, and that. To a lesser degree, that was throughout the entire country, um, but but really um, entrenched, deeply entrenched in the South. Um, you know that had that had lost the war. I so um, I have a question. Yeah. What is what is the term Jim Crow? What does that mean? I don't I don't know what that means. Is I, is that a term? Just a loose term for African American people? Is it is it? Do you know what uh, it means? I mean, what, where um, it comes from? Yes. Yeah, so so um, actually, he was. Well, we can look that up, but I, I think Jim Crow was actually a, a a a real person who started. Let's just look this up. Okay, we're we're not recording that. This you're going to cut this out, right? Yeah, I'll cut it out. Yeah, you'll cut it out. Okay. I just it's like you, you term you hear all the time, and you kind of assume you know what it means, but it, you know you don't. And you'll start out with Jim Crow was when you started. Yeah. So. But it's just like I've, I've always. I've thought about it, but I've never, you know, I, I assumed, I didn't know if it was a white person or a black person. <laughs> I'm just trying or, to find or, out. Or a made up name, you know. Etymology here. Okay. It... Jim Crow. Okay, so, uh, okay, you, are you ready? Yeah, so. Okay, uh, so start with Jim, three, two, one. Okay, so, so Jim Crow South is what we, what we call, and the Jim Crow laws are what we call the laws that discriminated against people because of their, because of their race. So what it resulted in in, Amer in in America in the South was that you had separate bathrooms, you had separate railroad cars, you had separate schools. Um, but Jim Crow, the, the origin of the word was Jim Crow was a was a, a minstrel figure. He was, and so minstrel figures were were white people who wore blackface, and he right. and he sang a song um, called "Jumpin' Jim Crow," and he was he was called Jim Crow, and so so he it became Jim Crow became the pejorative name for for African Americans for Negroes, and so um, so it was it was Jim Crow South was we were discriminating against people because of their, because of their race. So it was slang for African-American people. Yeah, it was a, it was a pejorative name. Okay. Um, and so, and so um, it just kind of became, it kind of moved from, he was a very popular, uh, you know, musician and actor and jumping Jim Crow. And so it just, it just kind of moved, migrated from him and his popularity to, sort right. of the term for everything that happened, life in the South. 
Now I, so, now I know. <laughs> okay, now you know, and we all know. Um, and and so, so Jim Crow South became sort of a mini, mini slavery. I mean, they weren't enslaved and considered as, as, um, as property anymore, but they were not, there was certainly no equality in, in life. And, and, and it was very, it was a time when there were um, horrifying things that had happened. If, if someone dared to speak up uh, who was African-American, he could, they could be lynched. Um, and nobody was enforced if, if, if a, 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 a vigilante group of, 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 of white men thought that some African-American man had stepped out of line and insulted his wife or something, they would, they would find him and lynch him and they were never brought to justice for that. So it was, it was a, it was a horrible time. Um, and, and so that we started to come out of that um, in the fifties and, and the first big chunk that came off of that wall was, uh, Topeka versus the board of education, uh, Brown versus the Topeka board of education. And that, that was, um, about segregation in the schools. And there was a Virginia school that was, that was part of that down, down near Farmville. Um, and, and so some very brave students at that high school, uh, Moton High School were, were part of that um, because they they were going to they were going to a school where when it rained um, they had to bring umbrellas into their classroom okay. and put them up because that so the what had become law and was upheld by our Supreme Court there was a court case called Plessy versus Ferguson in the late nineteenth century that that um, put into into law. And, and upheld the law of separate but equal, which means, and it was involved, and that was involving a railroad car. So it said that it was okay to have a separate railroad car for blacks and whites. Okay. And the separate but equal just kind of, that was a kind of a wink and a nod because it never separate. It was always separate, but never equal. Um, so the railroad car um, that the, the African Americans were on would have been dusty and dirty and had seats that were falling apart and the, the car that the whites were on, you know, would have been nice and plush and, and, uh, and so the schools were the same way. Um, and so, you know, there were, if you had a water fountain, you had a colored water fountain and you had a white water fountain, um, women who had, I mean, it got, it, it, it just was incredibly, uh, demeaning, um, for if you had a woman who was, who was your housekeeper, you built a separate bathroom for her down in the basement or had an outhouse for her because you didn't want her in your bathroom. Um, how, how, how awful is that? But anyway, the, it, it all started to crumble um, and we took a giant step forward in, the in 1954 with Brown versus Topeka Board of Education that said separate but equal cannot be the law of the land. It, everybody has to be together. You have to integrate the schools. You have to integrate um, you know, our country. So here in this country, um, I guess by studying the education, the movement of education for our African Americans, we can really get a, a capsule of, of everything else that was happening. Because right, right after the war, um, right after the war, you know, you had this whole enslaved group of people that were freed, and the majority of them uh, did not know how to read and write, and that was a, that was purposeful um, by the white population who didn't want. The slaves to learn how to read and write because they might, they might get um, ideas in their head about about equality and, and freedom and things like that. There were some that that knew how to read and write. Um, uh, Stonewall Jackson had a Sunday school before the Civil War. He had a Sunday school where he where he taught um, slaves how to read and write specifically so they could read the Bible. Um, but uh, he was really breaking the law by doing that. Um, and a lot of times. <laughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Yeah, thank you. A, a lot of times, um, um, children would would teach their, um, you know, the African American children were raised with white children. They were kind of raised to be their playmates, but then later to be their servants. Um, and a lot of times, they kind of went to school with them and things like that, and kind of learned to read accidentally. Um, or sometimes um, 
you know, there are some cases where they had to read, learn to read and write to help their owners do certain things. So, um, but afterward, they had to set up schools. And mostly these, this was uh, Christian societies from the North who came down here and established schools. And just to tell you the, the incredible hunger for education that came out of the, the newly freed population um, was amazing. So this is what was happening just in Stanton. Um, they, so a, um, a teacher came down from, from um, Maine and he arrived in 1865, August of 1865. So the war ended in April. He was here in, in August. And remember that Stanton and Augusta County and the South was under military rule now by this time. They were the losers. Okay. So the U.S. military was here and occupied it, and Stanton was the headquarters for military district number one. So, so there were there was the governance was by the military, and so they welcomed these these um, teachers to come in and start setting up schools for the freedmen. So, and he wrote that the colored people here are anxious for a school that a school be established, and I heartily second their desire. So they started a school um, right away, and they had. They, they did a survey of the, the, the African-American population right around Stanton, and there were 366 African-American children under the age of 14, right in this area, and 200 of the 366 um, were all ready to enroll in school just months after freedom, and then another 100 adults right in the area within five miles of Stanton okay. um, were also ready to, to go to school. Can you imagine if you've never learned to read and write as an adult trying to go back and learn that? It would be just so hard. But um, by October, they'd found a space upstairs in the courthouse, and they had uh, two classes, a day, two, two day classes and two evening classes with about 75 students in each class. Um, less than two weeks after they started that, they were told by the local population, get out of our courthouse. Okay. So they had to go find someplace else. By December, they found there were more teachers that had come. Um, they had found more space, and they conducted school four days a week with a student body of 128 only seven of them were over the age of 16 and then at night they had 250 students who were all over the age of 16 so adults who are working all day and then came to school at night to learn to read and write so it was amazing and then after reconstruction ended um and and the military occupation went away after 1870 after the 1870s then public school was established in, in Virginia. And right from the beginning, there was the white public schools. And this is the first time there was public school in Virginia in 1870. Okay. Yeah. And so there was the white school and then there were black schools and they were never equal. Um, so, um, so that's, but, but they were always um, had amazing attendance and, you know, some of the schools that came out of this, like Booker T. Washington high school, um, and Central High School. People don't really know about Central High School in uh, in Augusta County, which out near Beverly Manor, uh, which was Beverly Manor Elementary School. Yeah. Later, became Beverly Manor Elementary School. But so so Brown versus uh, the Board of Education was 1954. Um, as you might guess, Virginia and other states drug their feet, dragged their feet about about integrating schools. And so it was it was not until 1966 that Augusta County, Stanton, and Waynesboro integrated their schools. So they, it took them 12 years, and 12 years of trying to find creative solutions of how to, to weasel out of it. And Central High School was one of, one of Augusta County's ideas of how to weasel out of integrating their schools. They, they built, they said, because Augusta County had Augusta Training School for African Americans, which was a consolidated school that had elementary through and had two grades of high school. So it really wasn't a full full high school. And that was um, also out in the Beverly Manor community. That was right, it, it's wooden, now the wooden, uh, American Legion building. Yeah, the wooden building to the right, yeah. Right, right, and there's a there's a historic marker there so you can go out and look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so and so if, if parents wanted their students to get more higher education, they had to send them into Booker T. Washington to get, to get enough high school education to be able to then go on to, to college or, or some, some higher um, job, right. job situation. So, yeah. so um, Augusta County said, um, and, and Augusta County was facing the fact that there was 20% of the population was um, African-American 
in 1860. Um, by, by 1960, it was about 5% of the population. Yeah. So, you know, the population was disappearing. So they were closing up black schools and there were really only, um, there was Augusta training school and then there was a, there was an elementary school up in the New Hope area. Um, and that was it. So, but they, they knew they had to do something. They were under a lot of federal pressure to do something. So they came up, they said, let's, we've got an idea. We bought some land a few years ago out in the Beverly Manor area um, with the idea of maybe doing a consolidated school. So let's go ahead and do it. And they built Central High School. Um, and Central High School opened um, in the fall of 1960. Um, and it only ever operated for, it, there were five, five years that it operated. Um, and it was a it was a nice high school. It was nothing like Lee High School, um, but it did have a gymnasium and it did have classrooms and home ec rooms and and so it was it was the nicest that had ever occurred. And they they bust all the African American students from the entire Augusta County were bused there. So some of them left left well, home at five in the morning and got home at six at night. That was before the bypass, way before the bypass. So it's, it's you got to go always do way before the there. bypass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, and then they, they took Augusta training school and bumped it back down to an elementary school. Okay. And, and so, um, so it was, so the, the central high school, um, alumni association met for their 50th anniversary a couple of years ago, met at Beverly Manor elementary school. Unlike um, in most cases, when schools integrated in Virginia, um, the students went from the black school, which was inferior, to to the white school. So they were forced to go to a strange place and and integrate, you know, in an uncomfortable situation. You know, like so Booker T closed down, and they went to to Lee High School, um, but almost never did like the Lehigh, Lehigh close down and go to Booker T, um, which would have been more fair. Um, but in the case of Central High School, um, it didn't close up and, and shutter. shutter. It, okay. it became... Hang on a minute. I got to decline this. Sorry about that. That's all right. Yeah. Well, let me get you back. You got me back? Well, I hear you, but I don't see you back to meeting there we go okay so yeah, in, in the case in the case of um when when integration came to uh augusta county they they all moved to their appropriate high school so um well, they went to you lived you went to buffalo yeah gap. they went to buffalo gap or riverheads or wilson um or or fort defiance um but um Stewart Shaft wasn't, I don't think, had been built it yet. Wouldn't have been there yet. Yeah, um, but but they didn't shutter Central High School. They converted it. It first became uh, a middle school, and then it became Beverly Manor Elementary School. So it continued to live a long and, and useful life. Um, they added on to it um, at some point for Beverly Manor Elementary School. But so that's it's shuttered now. But but um, and I think it would make a great. Um, Museum for Augusta County history um, for maybe for our educational history of, of the area because it, it is fascinating um, and worthwhile history to remember. But um, so finally, 1966 uh, is when Stanton, Waynesboro, and Augusta County all fully integrated. And, um, and that was, you know, in the 60s, that's when we began doing that giant leap forward to get rid of Jim Crow and wash away that stuff. So we had um, the, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which was, um, which was and, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which gave us Fair Housing Act and, and voting, got rid of poll taxes and, and things like that. And, um, and so we began a process that is still, you know, we're still in the middle of today of getting rid of systemic, uh, systemic um, racial injustices in all parts of our society. So it's a long arc. Um, we're getting in, going in the right direction, but, um, but we've got a long way to go. So um, I will I, say there's one little confusing bit of information if you're a local, and that is there was a Beverly Manor school that's across, that became the Statler Brother Complex, the right. Manor Christian School. And are they even spelled the same? Yeah, they're spelled the same. It's, yeah, Beverly is always spelled L-E-Y, but, but that was a high school. 
Yeah, so that that was the, that was a high school, and then there's Beverly Manor that's out beyond what's the bypass now in the west end of town in the Beverly Manor on the Parkersburg t- t- Turnpike. Um, that's I, I used to work at Beverly Manor Elementary School, the, the one out that was the Central High School, and I would you know they would say the old Beverly Manor School. You know how they do it, Stan. Right. right. Uh, I will tell you one thing, uh, and my dad, who's would have been uh, 88 today, he, he today's his birthday, but he birthday. Been, he went in as a as a white man into an, uh, a former, imagine this is Pennsylvania County in Danville, Virginia. And you're talking about probably a population that's 60% Caucasian, 40% African-American. So when they integrated, it was a big, you know, it was a real, you know, as opposed to 5%. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he went to the former African-American high school and that's, you know, it had been like him going to central opening school. So they made the African-American high schools, the junior highs. Because okay. they were big, they were big high schools, uh-huh. and, uh, and I just remember him going in and but seeing the difference in the building. Like when I went to what Beverly Manor or Central, you know, there were little subtle things like they didn't have an auditorium; they had a cafeteria right. with a stage, and that's where I taught band in that building. And the gym floor wasn't wood; it was tile. You know, so there were like little subtle. Stages, right. Yeah. You know? So you know, even though like Booker T. Washington in in in, in Stanton was state of the art african american it was it was a wpa project that was done during the the depression um but it it never had a cafeteria it wow. never had a cafeteria and they were going to actually cut out some of the the part of the gymnasium and some of the locker rooms but the the uh parents kind of got all uh up in arms and and pleaded with the stanton school board to to not cut out the couple hundred dollars that they they needed for that so so it was always a, an uphill battle but but and there school, are, was, there was one school board and the school board would have been white that, that's right and yeah. you know they the the black schools always got the hand-me-down textbooks if the white schools got brand new textbooks then there's old ragged textbooks got passed down to the to the black schools but i think um from from talking to people um who went to those schools uh, and, and I've talked a lot with my uh, late f- friend, uh, Rita Wilson. Um, I think the, the quality of the teachers and the administration um, made up for those inequities of material things. They, they got an amazing education um, from those teachers. And, you know, they, I mean, that was the whole community. So it was, it was vital. Um, you know, and they, they were, they were relentless in making sure that their students were prepared for the world and were going to be shining examples. And, and yeah. they, they did their job. They were great. Teacher, the teachers would have grown up in through civil rights. So they really felt the, you know, felt the need to educate these young people to. Yeah, the, the, teachers of, would grown, the teachers would have grown up in Jim Crow. Um, and, and, you know, if you go back far enough, these teachers would have grown up. I mean, it, it's not a leap to know that if you're talking about the early 1900s, that their parents, the teachers' parents, would have been enslaved people. Uh, and certainly there were former enslaved people who were in our community until the, the 1920s and 30s. And, and so, so they, you know, they, they had a real sense of where they were coming from and what, um, you know, what they needed to achieve in the world. And, you know, they, it's just like, you know, on, on a bigger scale, you know, when I got on the board of supervisors, I realized as a woman, I had to work 10 times harder than any man that was on the board. And, you know, it, you know, it's exponentially the same way for African Americans trying to make their way um, into, into a, a racist, you know, uh, society yeah. um, where they, they didn't have a leg up. And so, um, so it's just an amazing, there's some amazing success stories out of all this. Um, I can tell you a couple, just a couple of them, just to let you know, um, these stories that we're, we're following. One, um, if you go down to Greenville today, um, and maybe we'll take you on a, if, if we do a next series, we'll take you on a journey to some of these places. Um, because down in Greenville, there's a log house that's being restored right now by a, um, a retired lawyer, in Augusta County named David McCaskey. And it's the Fannie Thompson house. And David and I uh, worked to get that house on the National Register of Historic Places, which means it's a special 
a special place in our history. Now you look at that house and it's fallen and it's literally fallen down. David is bringing it back uh, from, from almost beyond repair. Um, and, and this is, if you go down head South and you kind of veer to the left on the old road, it's no, on no, it's, it's on route 11, it's right on route 11. It's the one on the right. It's the one on the right. Um, oh, yeah, you can, it's obvious. It's sitting up on a hill. It's a, and, it, and right now it's got scaffolding all around it because David is, is putting new siding on it. And, I'm taking pictures of that before it, uh, before it came down. Yeah. Right. And so you pass the bank, then you, then you, and then it's not far. It's, it's right. It's on the right, on the before corner we, of the old cross, creek. Before you cross the creek. <laughs> before you cross the creek. That's right. And that, that creek, uh, there was a, there's a spring on the other side and the, the people in that house, their entire, the the entire time that people were living in that house from the 1870s to the 1970s, um, they went across that creek to a spring to get their water. Okay. They also had a sister in there. But anyway, that house, so what happened after the Civil War is, I think we told you in the last series that for the most part um, in, in Augusta County, there weren't large plantations where you would have large communities of African Americans at one place. So you had two or three people at, at one farm and two or three at another and your, your spouse would be at a different farm. It was called marrying abroad because you were hired out to another family for a year at a time. And so you, you didn't even get to live as a family unit. Um, your, your spouse might live um, on another farm or work in Stanton or work on the canal, you know, in Richmond and then come home only at Christmas time. So, so after the war, and after after everybody was freed, then you had this this uh, people just uh, milling about everywhere, moving about, trying to reun reunite with their family, with their spouses, with their children who had been separated and sold or or hired out somewhere. And so there was a, a great sort of confusion of people moving around. And in Stanton, they they set up in this military district. They set up a Freedmen's Bureau. And they had a, a register and people could come and register to say, hey, my name is this, my spouse is this person, and we have these children, and I come from here. So it was a, a great reuniting of families and, and people. And that Freedman's Register um, is a wonderful document of, of the, it, it just opens your eyes to, to sort of this, this gathering of people and, and legitimizing their their family relationships. Yeah, so, their existence in the family, yeah. Right, and so um, and so, but then then they had the dilemma of now they had to find a place to live, um, and they had to find work and 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 you know raise their family and take care of themselves. So they they all of a sudden you get these little settlements at the edge of all of our communities: Greenville, Middlebrook, um, Mount Sydney, Stanton. Um, so you had these clusters of, of African Americans who settled, there, there's a neat one that we're exploring now called Jonesboro out near Buffalo Gap High School along the railroad there. Um, so you had these little settlements that were African American and, and that settlement usually had a school, it had uh, a church, because uh, for the first time people could, they could learn to read and write, they could, they could worship as they pleased. And so, um, and so these, uh, these little settlements happened, and that happened in Greenville. Um, at each end of Greenville, um, there were these little settlements, and so this house is part of that settlement. It is the last survivor, uh, intact survivor of that. There may be a couple other houses that are were part of that, but it's the last intact survivor of that settlement, um, and it was. It's called the Fanny Thompson House, and um, and and so there were there was a community there of 20, 20 or thirty houses. There was a church there called Mount Ed Church. There was a, the school was actually at the other end of Greenville where the Greenville Mini Mall is now. The school okay. was down there and there was another church down there. So it was basically at each end and they were right next to the railroad so they could get job on the railroad. They could use the railroad to go find work other places. It was a thriving, prosperous community. And that house, so the, the first owners of that house, uh, well, the first, they were renters first and then owners was Fanny and Shed Thompson. And Shed was her husband. And, um, and they, um, they came from really up on the north side of Riverheads. We see them on Hotchkiss's map. And then, and then they moved. Shed may have died very soon after they moved to Greenville. 
Moved, and to, so, moved to the city. Moved to the big city of Greenville, um, probably to get to get work. Um, and and so Fanny, what we think she was think she was a laundress, um, and you know, which she washed clothes. And if she's close to the railroad, she might have done a lot of laundry for the railroad too. Right. Um, but um, so she lived there. Uh, her their children lived there, um, and their grandchildren lived there. And then the last lady that that lived there um, was. Fanny Thompson's niece, um, and and so and she she lived there. Her name um, was Miss Sue Porter, uh, and um, and she she lived there until 1974. She was almost 100 years old when she died, okay. and so that house has never been lived in by anybody other than a slave, a former slave, or the children or grandchildren of slaves. Because mm -hmm. Sue Porter was the daughter of a an enslaved person. So uh, it, it just is, it, so the story that goes around their house and that, and, and what they went through is, is an amazing story. And so we wrote that up and when we took it down to Richmond to get it on the national register, we were, we were there that you have to go and do a little hearing and tell about the house and then they vote on whether to make it, put it on the register or not. Right. And we were there with all these nice rich houses. Um, these, these nice, uh, you know, very historic houses and two stories, white, you know, white yeah, platform, yeah. Right. And, um, or even nicer, sort of almost like plantation type right. of houses or, or nice Victorian houses or, but, um, and then David gets up there and he says, I guess you're wondering why, um, um, we want to put this house that's so fallen down, you could throw a cat through it, um, on the national register. And, uh, and then we, then we told him and, all, I mean, they voted for it unanimously, uh, and and uh, and then afterward, they they all just flocked to us and wanted to know more about the house and the story that was there. They just ignored all those nice rich houses. Right. They came right to us um, because it is such an incredible story, and it's the type of house that doesn't get saved very often. So David should be um, very proud of 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 what he's doing to is save. He didn't live in the house. Um, he probably is going to rent it out um, because he, yeah. he lives he lives in a restored African American church in Mount Sydney now. Okay, so, yeah, I thought he lived up there. Yeah. Yep. So, um, but uh, but there's just some some neat things. So you know these were people who were learning to read and write. So if you look closely on the siding on the house under the porch that's been kind of protected from the weather, you can see ABCs are scratched out like somebody was practicing their ABCs. I'm practicing their ABCs. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll throw a picture up of that. So that's, so these kind of stories, and when you, when you start looking at their story, you look at, they went up to Pennsylvania and Ohio to try to get work during the Great Depression, and even before that, during World War One. So, so the, the story of the African American story in Augusta County is encapsulated in the story of that house. Mm -hmm. So that's one, there, there's another neat story of a, of a, uh, a slave who, um, was a slave at Folly Farm, which is just south of, of, um, of Stanton. The Folly and, Mills, yeah. Yeah, well, so it's Folly Farm is, you know, Folly Mills, they had, the farm had a mill, so that's how it got its right. name. It's Folly, Folly Mills Creek that runs through the farm and you cross Route 11, it goes all right under Route 11. Um, and so this was a pretty big farm and he had enough slaves that he rented a lot of them out. Um, and sometimes he had 30 or 40 slaves and he made probably Joseph Smith was the owner and he probably made a thousand dollars a year by renting out his slaves. One of the slaves shows up on his, on his list of slaves, um, in the early 1850s as 15 year old Jefferson and Jefferson, um, ends up getting rented to Francis McFarland, who was a Presbyterian minister at Bethel Presbyterian church. And, um, and he's there. There's a, there's a whole lot of stories about Jefferson. Jefferson gets sick, has to go back to Folly, almost dies, but then he goes, he goes back to the McFarlands. He becomes a very trusted person. And all this time in, in, uh, in the paperwork at, at Folly and in McFarland's diary where he mentions Jefferson, Jeff, Jeff, Jefferson, 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 that's all you ever hear. And then and Jefferson, he, he rents Jefferson out by the year. And then as soon as the war's over, um, Jefferson, he, there's a rental agreement that, that survives of him. Instead of renting Jefferson from Joseph Smith, he makes an agreement, a hiring agreement straight with Jefferson. 
um, for the same amount of money and gives him a suit of clothes, just like he <clears throat> had to anyway. Um, but, but Jefferson's last name appears for the first time, Jefferson Howard. Now, the, what I understand in talking to African-American genealogists is that African-Americans had last names that they had chosen themselves for whatever reason, and, but they, those were secret among them and not necessarily known by, by their, their white owners. Okay. But as soon as the war is over, they have last names. And so Jefferson all of a sudden has a last name for the first time. And, um, and then he and his wife show up and put their names in that, that Freedmen's Register. So Jefferson uh, was married to Betty Cameron and they had three children. And they were married, obviously they would have been married, when you look at the ages of the children, they were married by 1860 um, when McFarland first starts renting Jefferson. And you never hear of Betty or the children or even that Jefferson had a whole family. And so that's just sort of the, uh, the interesting thing that this subculture that existed but was ignored by by white society. So they, they ended up living um, out in the Arbor Hill area for the rest of their life. They're buried at Mount Tabor. Um, I'm trying to find out a lot more about them because with their children, they, um, and the Howard name is, is a name, an African-American name around here. So I'd like to see if I could find out who, if, if there's a picture of Jefferson or, or Jefferson's children and find out more about them. So, um, um, but they, that's just interesting, interesting stories. Oh, the Howardsville Turnpike. The, the Howard's, Howardsville Turnpike was named for Howardsville, Virginia, um, right. over over on the James River, where it's where right we there where it occurs. <laughs> yes, but but that is interesting, and maybe maybe he they chose you know their last name um, because of the Howardsville Turnpike. Who knows? Yeah. So um, so so there's there's, there's if, some. If, if you find that out, remember you heard it from me first. That's right. It was Richard <laughs> who came up with that. That was, well, his, I mean, that, was that was his deduction. Well, that that does kind of. Yeah, yeah. You, I, I mean, mean, he would have been Bethel, living Bethel and working. Presbyterian is on Howardsville Turnpike. He would have been living and working right along the Howardsville Turnpike, and he would have known that it was the Howardsville Turnpike. So that, there you go. That that like, might like, have solved like that word. that mystery. The other interesting thing was that you get all of a sudden, see, before the war, African Americans were, they were religious but they were required, it was against the law for them to have their own separate religious services. So they sometimes, like Francis McFarlane as the Presbyterian minister would go out to farms where there were a, a number of African-American families and he would hold religious services for okay. them. Um, uh, or, but most of the time they, they were required to go sit in the galleries like at, at, at Bethel or Tinkling Spring. And so they, they were required to go to their white churches. And um, as soon as, as soon as they, um, you know, had their freedom, they were like, heck with this, we're going to go to our own churches, we're going to build our own churches. And so all these little uh, African American churches, uh, a lot of them were AME, African Methodist Episcopal or Baptist, um, just popped up all over, all over the, the county and the country. And, um, and they just disappeared. One North Carolina Presbytery described it as our, our, our colored um, worshipers disappeared like like snow in an April sunshine, it just melted away, um, and and so McFarland has to go to to Bethel Church to to go to a session meeting within months after this after the Civil War ended, and to purge to purge the the roles of their their um, their black members because they just weren't coming anymore. So it was happening here just like everywhere else. So. Um, so I'm sure Jefferson um, and his, and his and and Betty went uh, somewhere else uh, in the in the Arbor Hill area. Um, Smoky probably they probably went to Smoky Smoky Row. Road. Yeah, um, that's that's probably where they went. But um, there are some interesting stories with those little churches um, too as well that we'd like to explore. And um, so the stories are there. Um, you have to dig a little bit deeper because they haven't ever been. Uh, been brought to the surface, but they're there and they're rich and they're powerful. Uh, and and um, we'd like to spend a lot more time exploring those. Yeah, I know that um, in 19, it was in the 80s, they did a, a, 
uh, what was the name of that play? James Weldon Johnson. What did he write? He wrote, he was, uh, sorry, I can't remember right now, but anyway, it's a play. oh, God's Trombones. That's what it was. You ever read that book? Anyway, it's called, no. but it, it's a, it, James Weldon Johnson was an African American writer. And he wrote, he said, you know, one day maybe the African American church will, you know, society will again integrate the African-American church will go away and kind of the style of the preaching, you know, the Southern African-American style of call back, call and, you know, call and answer. And so he wrote this play and Paul Hildebrand, who's back in town now and worked at Shin and Arts, uh, the KKK had marched through town. So he decided he was going to do this show about, and he took these sermons and made a play out of it. And I, and, and, and I will say this, I was, I was one of the white people in the play, but he got, we went to all the African-American churches and I realized then all these churches, you know, right downtown near Hardy's, all those churches, you know, 1865, you know, uh -huh. you know, they all opened in 1865. And I got thinking about, it. you know, after, after time, I started to realize, and there was this underground and Rita was around then. And there was this underground communication amongst those churches growing up in the South as I did. It was unbelievable because they say, okay, we're going to do this show. And it was packed. I mean, it was an integrated audience and it was packed and they did the shows in the churches mm -hmm. and it was done like theater. It was like theater, TV, you know, it was great. And you couldn't tell whether you were in church or you were watching the play because it was kind of the same thing. So they would do the show in Waynesboro, pack the place, but didn't see it in the paper. It was like phone calls, you know, and, and, and I found out there was this underground communication, but which made sense, you know, with like Martin Luther King. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the one place you could go speak freely was in the right. church. You know, that right. was your meeting hall. That was your lodge. That was everything. Yeah, the, the church, the church was, the church and the schools were the basis of their community. That's where they could be safe, and that's where they could they could shine. And you know, before before you know the '60s, there was a whole you know it was like a mirror. You had the white community with all the white professionals and the white working class, and you had the black professionals and the black working class. So you know, Stanton had black dentists, and black doctors, black lawyers. Um, and the other the other amazing story that I should just mention, and there's. And, and people should go and, and read and learn about these is Montgomery Hall Park. Um, and that was, if, if you're talking about like that support group, that three-legged stool of the African-American community, in our area, it was the churches, the schools, and, and Montgomery Hall Park. Montgomery Hall Park, it, the, you have to think that all the places that were off limits to, to African-Americans, if they could go to the theater, they had to sit up in the gallery. Right. Um, if they, they were allowed to go to, to Gypsy Hill Park one day of the year, and that was it. Um, and so, and then, and they were allowed to swim in the pool. It was the last day of the summer. They were allowed to swim in the pool. And then Stanton, how degrading is this? Then Stanton drained the pool. Okay. Um, um, and, and that was the one day of the year that they were allowed to go to Gypsy Hill Park. So, and if you look across the state, they couldn't go to Virginia Beach. Uh, Shenandoah National Park, there was a there was a, one campground that was the Negro campground, and that's where they had to go if they went to Shenandoah National Park. There was there was there was a park out um, in the George Washington National Forest, kind of past Clifton Forge, out in there. There was one thing down in Lynchburg. So that, but there was something in Charlottesville, but they were all inferior. Um, and then the, the even beaches, like the beaches, even the beaches at Buck Row Beach. You couldn't Buck go to Virginia Row. Beach. You could go to Buck Row. There was there was a section of Buck Row that was set aside for the black people, and that was it. So even even thinking uh, of going into the great outdoors like we do, um, and was just didn't happen because there was no place. And the 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 African American community in Stanton, led by the religious leaders and the educators and the professional class in in Stanton, lobbied Stanton for a place. To have as their own as a park, and um, and and Stanton, to their credit, bought what was a plantation on the edge of Stanton, uh, Montgomery Hall, and bought it and and turned it over to the black community and said, "This is yours. You run it. We'll give you a small budget. Um, you can raise money on your own to do more things." And um, and they turned this into the the recreational jewel of the entire state um they had the they had a bowling alley now that's because the plantation house montgomery hall had a bowling alley okay. and and then so the the black community fixed it up 
It was the only black bowling alley run by African Americans in the entire state of Virginia. They had a swimming pool. Within a couple of years, they had a swimming pool. Um, and, and, and they, the, um, some of the lifeguards and all had to go to Tennessee to, to take swimming lessons and, and learn how to be lifeguards and stuff because they didn't think that black people knew how to swim. So they, they had, she had to go down to a, a black university down in Tennessee and take lessons to learn how to do that. Um, and, and so they had a swimming pool. They had, um, girls, black Girl Scout troops, Boy Scout troops, 4-H troops went there. They had a campground. They had jamborees there. Um, and, and they had every kind of outdoor activity that you can imagine. Sometimes they even had horseback riding there and it was, it was an amazing. So, so the, the minute books are in our historical society. Now the, the black community had a committee that ran it and, um, did fundraisers. And then they also, the VFW, the black VFW built, met there. They had dances, social, social events for all the, uh, you know, the African-American social groups. And um, one year, well, it, it averaged from the, so it, it went from 1947 when they opened it um, till 1966 when everything was integrated and it got closed and then, you know, kind of fell into disrepair for a while and then got reopened and re-energized. And so now Stanton has two wonderful parks um, that are both totally integrated, of course. But um, in the summertime, you know, so it was used in the winter, but in the summertime what, during its season, it had an average of 18,000 people that visited it a year, a summer. Yeah, Eight, I heard that. yeah, yeah like from, people would come from all, I mean, they come from, from everywhere. Yeah. Church groups would come from Richmond, um, you know, Virginia Beach, you know, that they, they you know, they camp, the Boy Scouts would camp there, you know, from all over. Um, it was. We're, we're going to Staunton. <laughs> hopefully they knew how to say it, but anyway, yeah. Um, so it was, it, it's an incredible story. So that's, um, we got that on the National Register of Historic Places. And there's, there's some historic markers out there too, but that is uh, an amazing, an amazing story. So that house up on the hill was a plantation house. That's right. And it's now the, the Parks and Rec the Georgia, uh, building. And it has yeah. all the, the buildings, uh, the, the rooms in the building are, and the building itself is named for all those people who were instrumental in the park who are on that committee. So okay. it's the Gibbons building. Um, and um, so all the people who are, who are part of that, that committee um, are all have their names. And there's a, you know, there's the, the flower garden in the front has a name for, for a particular person. So it's all, it's all named for all those people. And it, it's, it's an incredible story. All these stories can be read, by the way, in the Augusta County Historical Society bulletins. And if you're a member of the Historical Society, you get those bulletins as a free perk of your membership. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. hint, hint. Well, Nancy, so, I think we've, uh, anything else you need? We, this, I think we've kind of we've, taken it up to modern modern day times. Yeah, uh, you know. Well, I, I would just uh, ask the integration of the schools. That's kind of, you know, past nineteen sixty-six. Yeah. yeah. Well, the the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights of the nineteen sixties. So the integration of the schools, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. Um, those those are kind of watershed times. So we enter a new era of now, and, and now a lot of the the systemic racism is kind of pushed underground. Um, uh, although it's bubbling to the surface, um, I think in, in recent years, so it, it's not gone and we've got a lot of work to do, um, of clearing away the vestiges of, of that and, and, and embracing this history. That's all of our history. That's, that's just so amazing. So I would like to say, as we're thinking about our next series, if you have ideas, if you want to flesh out any of these series that we've done so far, with some more interesting stories and ideas. And we could take any one of those stories, like the Fanny Thompson house and make a whole series on that, you know, a whole, a whole show on that. Um, but give us ideas and step up and sponsor, sponsor us. And uh, let's keep going because we've got a rich history here that, that um, we could do for the rest of our lives, do the series for the rest of our lives. And I'd like to do, you know, the, in the African American communities, you've got like Newport and you've mm -hmm. got, uh, we got the Port Republic neighborhood over in Waynesboro with Shiloh Baptist Church. That's right. a, an amazing story. 
you know, they, and that was, uh, they've got um, a hotel, old hotel there that people don't realize that Augusta County led the state in the early 1900s in apple production. And those apple pickers were migrant workers who came in, often African-American workers or even African-Americans from the Caribbean, they came there and stayed and picked apples here. So there's a whole nother uh, interesting story that uh, Amy Tillerson Brown, who's a professor at, at Mary Baldwin has been doing that's, that's fascinating. Okay. Anyway, well Nancy, this has been as great and uh, I hope our audience stays in touch with us. Uh, th mm -hmm. Thanks again to Catherine Mo Morris, retired librarian of all people for being our major sponsor for this show. Uh, and, um, and I've learned a lot and Nancy, you're a, you know what, uh, Catherine calls you a, um, what does she call you? Well, yes. she called us in our last little note she sent, called us both treasures. So yeah, she said you're a treasure to the community. So yeah. Well, she yeah. said the same about you. So yeah, well, I mean, I you got know, you. I'm a frustrated comedian, but anyway, but you're, you're, you're a historian. <laughs> anyway. All right. So, well, thank you very much, uh, folks out there that, uh, listen to these and they kind of serve as podcasts. I mean, I, I know, um, uh, uh, William Browning across the mountain over in Orange listens to these and he probably listens to it, listens to them as a podcast while he's working, yeah. raising money for Woodbury Forest School. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Alumni director, assistant alumni director, but, but I'm, you know, these kind of serve as a podcast and a visual with the pictures. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so, uh, keep in touch with us and, uh, I'm saying, go, on, go ahead and say it. We'll be back. Yeah.